I've said to people who may not be at the stage where they can commit even one day a week yet to writing, even an hour in the company of your work in progress every day, even if you don't add to it, even if you are just with it and you spend that hour concentrating on the idea of what you are doing, even that is better than nothing. And even that will cumulatively make a difference. Um, I do, I do, I do, I think I do believe in the whatever it is, 10,000 hours theory. Um, the technical aspects of writing certainly do become easier with practice, like the practice of a musician. I often compare it with the practice of a musician. You could also compare it with the practice of an athlete or a weight trainer or a card sharp or a magician. The technical business of putting sentences down on paper or on a screen, certainly <coughs> you get used to it. You reach a point where you can write about anything. It's part, it's part of what you do. You've learned that. It's like becoming an airline pilot. You, you can do it. The Maybe some of the difference between that and being <coughs> a profession and, and being a writer is that there are other aspects of writing that don't become any easier at all. In fact, for me, and I suspect for many, they become more difficult. Um, the idea of challenging yourself to go further, the idea that just because you can write about anything doesn't mean you should. You should find what's harder, what scares you. Um, everything I write now feels a lot scarier than it did when I first started writing. I have no idea <laughs> what a monstrous profession it is. <laughs> when I first started, you just go into it. And um, that's also what makes it exciting. That's also what makes you keep wanting to do it. The fact that it never becomes easy, the fact that it never becomes rote. It's always new. So yeah, just do it. Um, what she said. <laughs> I'd, I'd probably, probably go a little further and say you really need to commit. Uh, you really need to burn to do it. And you really need to understand at the same time that it is a monster, that it wants you and it's going to eat you up. Um, but it's nothing to do with earning money. But it's nothing to do with any of these definitions of professionalism that we have been <laughs> failed to <laughs> fail to reach here. It, it's going to be this thing that burns you off, and, and if it is, then it will continue throughout your life, whether you're doing it 24 hours a day or whether you can only like, do it one hour a day. If, it, if it's a monster, if it's eating you, 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 you will have no choice but to do it. And, and really, I think that's the thing you should be looking for. What I've seen since I sold that story in 1966 is this weird, and I've seen it not just, just in writing, but, but curiously enough, and I'm sorry to make another image from climbing, but I saw it in climbing too. Um, it is incredibly uh, inviting to say to yourself, I need space to write, so I'll write to buy it. Now, I've seen, I saw that happen to climbing. I saw guys who were good enough, as it were, to be professionals before professional climbing was invented as a thing. And the difference between them before they became professionals and after was a bit sad because they were no longer enjoying themselves. They had allowed professionalism to become a drag. And they, you could see them not enjoying their climbing, which is, of course, the very thing that they were trying to finance. Um, so I think that if you're going to do writing, you should perhaps keep that in mind as well. That essentially, if it's going to become a trade, and if it's going to become a slog, and if 
almost things around writing, like getting published, publicizing yourself, making yourself into a brand, all of those things, if they're going to become a bigger monster than the writing itself, then you should maybe think about that. I, I would never, even now, allow those areas of writing, uh, of publishing, to interfere with the monster. As far as I'm concerned, it's about the monster. It's not about publicity. It's not about making a career. Because the moment it becomes that, it stops being fun. You know, um, I say that I will do my best to avoid it, and I will. I'll go home tomorrow, and I'll <laughs> I'll find some way of not writing. But, but, but the monster, that's because it's a monster. And I really, you know, I'm really rather reluctant to engage it sometimes. <coughs> Because it will eat me up, and I want to be eaten up by the monster. I don't want to be eaten up by the monster. That's the relationship you should be in with it, I think. I think on the face of it, writing fiction for a living is is a ridiculous and quite stupid thing to do. And uh, in reality, it's quite ridiculous and stupid as well. But, um, I mean, I don't know. Imagine a trade where you once you can never really learn the exact skill set that you can then just repeat again and again. Each new project seems to require a whole new set of skills, as if you've, you know, and hence a lot of people starting a new novel or, you know, any kind of creative thing and thinking, I've forgotten how to do this. Last, or, or the last time I did it, it was just a fluke and it just fell randomly into place. Um, and, you know, obviously there is the, the, uh, the financial insecurity side of it, but, um, you know, as as Mike and Nina say, you have to you have to really want to do it, even if it is a bizarre kind of masochism type deal. Um, and I, I was I also I do agree with the ten thousand hours thing that, that Nina said. Um, be you know if if you do if you do want to become a writer, then be prepared to to write a whole lot of rubbish, and uh, furthermore, enjoy doing it. Um, enjoy that freedom. Learn from every every bit of it, and um, and beware. Yeah, well, that's what I wanted to say. Beware the kind of it's it's very easy um, to build up such a zealous head of steam when you're a writer, um, especially early on, and you finish something, and you want to show as many people as you can. But one strange thing about us writers, we're kind of riddled with self doubt, but at the same time. We can sometimes think we're more ready than we are to show our work to the world. So, you know, in the rear, in the unlikely event of anyone wanting any writing advice from me, I would say, <laughs> don't show anything to anyone until it's polished like a thousand suns, shines like like nobody's business. Because for some people, you know, especially if you're sending stuff around to agents, you only get one shot to create an impression. You know, I don't want to say too much like Eminem. You get one shot to show these guys what you can do. <laughs> The mic over now. <laughs> um, yeah, I just echo that stuff to, uh, about making you know, making time for it, and also being creative with how you make time for it. I I worked at the Bodleian Library in Oxford for a bit, which was a great and really fascinating place to work, but really, really busy, 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 sort of stressful job. And I found that in the evenings, I I couldn't. Like however much time I made for writing, which I was being disciplined about doing, I was just knackered and like mentally and physically. So I started. Well, I started, which this wouldn't work for me now, but back then I was able to. I started setting the alarm an hour and a half earlier in the morning and getting up and doing some writing then. And uh, again, it was that thing of not not having the any of the day kind of already in your mind, that kind of freshness of, of waking up, it, it worked brilliantly for me at that point in my life. It wouldn't work for me now, but I think there's a, there's a way, you, there are ways you can be creative with where that, where you can mark out that time. And sometimes if it's a situation like that, where you've got an hour and a half and then you've got to go to work, you, the, the limitation of it, that where you can't really control the fact that you've got to go to work after that. That sometimes helps liberate you a bit because um, you know that you've just got this period. Necessity. Yeah. But the second thing I would say, which I, have, well, having done that, having made made your space, for me the thing that 
is so the, I think the thing that keeps bringing me back to writing, the thing that I really like is to sort of further Mike's analogy with the monster is when you are being kind of vigorously and violently chewed up and eaten and <laughs> bone crunched by by this monster that to the point that it's all you can all you can think about and where you're kind of um, getting into a sort of quite a messy situation with it. But that but and what I mean by that I suppose is that the moment where the writing overtakes the thinking process. And Ray, Ray Bradbury said, don't think. That was one of his kind of answers to this question. I, I have that written on my desk, don't think. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, so, it seems simple, but it's so, it's so brilliantly important. It's that thing of shutting down all those editorial instincts for a bit, because you've got plenty of time to bring those to bear <clears throat> on a piece of work once you've actually done something that's worth editing. Just shut those up and, and just find the ways to trick out that part of you that suddenly starts to invent things where you, where you don't really know what's going on. <coughs> you, that's where the thrill is in writing, because yeah. suddenly you, you're, you're on, on board some ride that you don't know where it's going, and you're experiencing it for the first time just as a, as a reader might. Um, and so I would say look, look for that, look for what, be kind of analytical about that in the sense of looking for what, what triggers it, what are there tricks that you can burn yourself to make that happen. And I think Bradbury did a lot of listing because he felt that if he just wrote stuff, that kind of stream of consciousness thing, you just write and write and write. Don't stop moving your pen, just keep writing any old crap onto the page. And then suddenly at some point, the monster wakes up and comes in and starts writing it for you. There are all kinds of tricks, you can look them up on the internet, the writers give loads of advice in different ways to do it. Find those tricks and, and, and employ them. And never, never, ever, ever put the brake on it, because I think, I almost, I'm so superstitious of doing that, I think that if you were to, if you ever sort of throw in a sort of editorial challenge to the monster at that point, and say, well, when, what the hell am I coming up with this for? This has not, this doesn't fit with my big grand plan at all, and this will mess up this scene and that scene, and it undermines this, and this isn't what that character would do. As soon as you do that, I think you're kind of doing some weird sort of psychological damage to, to, to your own instincts. So you just have to run with that. Just and that, that, will be, that will be the thing that, that you come up with that is interesting and unique and not derivative and, and that is from some weird place in, in your gut and, um, and therefore probably the, far better than anything that you can actually think up by thinking. It's really, well, it's really <coughs> worth looking up. You just mentioned Ray Bradbury and I, he was one of the first people I read on How I Write. And it's really worth looking up his lists method. And he used to just list these freakish titles like The Freaks or The, the Thing, the, the Devil, The Jar. The, and you see how through, through his career, those actually all became short stories. And he describes how he'd just sort of sit in a chair and let that story happen inside his head. And, they wouldn't always immediately happen. He might have a list, a title on his list that he wouldn't have a story for for another 10 years. But eventually that story would arrive for him. I love reading about him, how he wrote. It's really inspiring, well worth looking up. We've got about 15 minutes left, so I'd like to try to open the questions from the audience. They all 